The climate of Northern Virginia became much as it is today about 5,000 years ago. Prehistoric people settled near rivers and streams. Food was abundant. With the coming of modern civilization also came people. A great many people. The population of Virginia reached 1 million in 1830. By 2010, the population stood at 8 million. Modern development has brought unprecedented environmental stresses and challenges. People created the problems, and now people must solve the problems. But how? All actions flow from values. Since we started as a meditation group, Buddhist meditation group, people often ask us, what environmental work got to do with Buddhism? What ecological restoration work got to do with Buddhist practice? So people automatically think that Buddhism is a equivalent of just a meditation practice. And I would say that, yes, meditation practice is uh, essential, but that's only beginning. What we really have to do is uh, we have to engage ourselves in whatever we are doing, the actual work. If we are thinking uh, nature is beautiful, nature is great, and then environmental work is wonderful, but if we stop right there, then we are only dealing with our own sentiment. And our own sentiment is not really real relationship with anything else. We actually using our work as a microcosm of that vision. So when we first started our nursery, and we looked at that, individual plant alone cannot function. What these plants actually, how they work is that they have to come in a communities. Individual plant doesn't mean much unless they really belong to that uh, larger organic unit in the plant community. And then they learn how to relate them, you know, with each other, with other living wildlife, and then non-living conditions like soil and the climate and sun and the water. So they learn um, how to relate and this relationship change uh, all the time. The dynamics never, you know, stand still. Peace within our lives, conservation of the wild, restoration of our lands. These are the goals of the Earth Sangha, but how do they go about their work and how well is their message received? Here we are in a portion of our wild plant nurseries container yard. This is a very unusual kind of facility, as you can see if you look around. There are a couple of very unusual aspects of this. Uh, one of them, perhaps one of the most important ones, ha has to do with uh, where these plants come from. We have well over 200 species now represented at the nursery. All of these species are native to this area. Uh, but these plants are also uh, not just native, they're, they're what we call local ecotypes. So these plants here that we have here, they're actually genetically representative um, of these species as they, as they actually occur uh, in, in our area. Most of the work here is done on a volunteer basis. So this is a real community nursery. It's a real community. The people who work, who supply most of the labor are just doing it just because they care about this stuff. They come in here, they, they sow the seeds, they tend the seedlings, they, they help move the plants out when the time comes. A lot of the stock here feeds our own uh, restoration sites on, on public lands. We partner with a lot of local uh, government agencies. My name is Carolyn Haynes. I'm with the Arlington Regional Master Naturalists. Our organization trains individuals to become volunteers throughout the community to do a wide variety of projects to support the betterment of our natural resources. Uh, we have chosen Ursanga this year to be one of our focus projects because we really like to support types of organizations that are really making a difference in our community. And their model has just been so successful 
that we would want to make sure that continues to be successful into the future. One of the things we really like about our Sangha is their ability to attract people and volunteers from all different walks of life and from all different age groups. And the, the volunteer component of that has been a terrific way of educating young people about the importance of our natural environment and um, seeing what we can do about it and making a, a positive impact in the world. Number three is, thank you for cutting me off. It didn't look like there was enough space between my car and the next one to accommodate your SUV. Thank you for demonstrating the extra few yards of road folded into my truncated perspective. <laughs> and thank you for not truncating my car in the process. If we can't build a bigger and more solid mandate for conservation, it's, it's very difficult to see uh, how we're going to make the kind of progress that we're going to need to make if we want to keep all these species of, of plants growing here. In McLean, Virginia, the Native Arboretum Project is transforming the 20-acre Marie Butler Levin Preserve into an extensive collection of plants native to the greater Washington, D.C. area, creating a botanical library as a public resource for building ecological literacy and for creating a stronger mandate for conservation. There are several trails through the preserve's forests and visitors can see a variety of interesting native plants already growing on the grounds. But the preserve's native flora is threatened by invasive alien plants. The invasives have displaced native trees, shrubs, and herbs. If left unmanaged, the invasives would also tend to convert more and more forests to thicket. Invasive vines weaken trees and make them more likely to topple. Invasive thickets and vine tangles interfere with forest regeneration by suppressing tree seedlings. The spread of the invasives also degrades the habitat of many native animals. We call this area the restored habitat area. And when we started working here several years ago, it really was just a green dead zone. The, the ground layer was almost entirely covered with English ivy and with a couple of other species of um, very invasive alien uh, vines. And uh, the shrub layer was mostly absent, but the few shrubs that were here uh, were uh, also alien species. And to deal with this situation, we took out everything. We just pulled out all the um, uh, invasive alien shrubs, and then we kind of unzipped the ivy. We just uprooted all the ivy and rolled it down the slope and then hauled it out. We took this whole area down to the soil, and then we covered the soil uh, with burlap and then we put about, I think, about six inches of, of mulch on, on top of the burlap to help hold it. Here we are in front of um, what we call the witch hazel grove. This is a group of shrubs, all of the same species, witch hazel. That's all this stuff back here that you can see here. Witch hazel is uh, it's an interesting native shrub. When those seed capsules ripen, they'll crack open and the witch hazel will throw the seed. It's a seed dispersal mechanism so that the offspring don't grow so close to the parent. Okay, here we've crossed over into a portion of the park uh, where we haven't yet uh, started any invasives control. And as you can see, it's really a very different kind of place, really a very different world. Uh, if you, you look around, almost all of the ground layer, the plants growing along the ground, and almost all of the shrubs in this area, and, and indeed almost all of the vines, uh, are invasive alien species. What's happening is that the, the invasive vines climb the trees and, and uh, they'll tend to pull the trees over. The invasive ground layer is an interesting kind of structural feature of what you see here. The invasive ground layer is preventing tree seedlings from germinating. If you look around, you don't see any little baby trees. So that means that the forest isn't properly stocked in a way that will preserve itself. As the big trees eventually die, there won't be any little trees uh, around to succeed them. The forest canopy will come down and the shrub layer, the invasive shrub layer will come up and you end up with a very dense thicket. Okay, so here we are by the rain garden at the Marie Butler Levin Preserve. The rain garden is a collaborative project between our organization and the Fairfax County Park Authority uh, and, uh, and a, a couple of other local agencies. And the idea here, the garden is actually in the center of a sort of bowl, a natural bowl that extends, that covers about an acre, uh, includes a little portion of Kirby Road, which you can see in the background there, and some forest and, and some of the field here. 
and it takes in whatever rainfall runs off that acre or so is directed here. The land here is sculpted to route the water into the garden. And the garden acts like a huge sponge. It's full of this specially absorbent soil-like material that extends down about six feet from the surface. So it just takes in all that water and it holds it for a little while uh, and then releases it uh, slowly into the surrounding soil. So that slows the rate at which the runoff uh, actually hits the stream. And it also has a little bit of a filtering function. It, it um, uh, can filter out some of the pollutants that wash off the road, especially the oil and, and in the winter the salt. Mason Neck is a great place to learn local history and the nature of the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Plain. Most of Mason Neck is protected for conservation. The peninsula is home to Pohick Bay Regional Park, Gunston Hall Plantation, Mason Neck State Park, and the Mason Neck National Wildlife Refuge. In 2001, the Meadowood Recreation Area was designated the newest protected area. Meadowood consists of 800 acres of forest and horse pasture. Here, the Earth Sangha is collaborating with the Federal Bureau of Land Management on several restoration projects for the property. Meadowood consists of about 800 acres of woods and open fields and is a nice natural area and recreation spot in Fairfax County. The slope behind me several years ago was a completely barren area and it's very steep as you can see. It erodes right down into a stream that's right on the other side of the fence. Through our challenge cost share partnership with Earth Sangha, we've been working for several years to restore this slope. As you can see, it's very well vegetated now. We've used hundreds of volunteer hours to replace the grasses. We planted native grasses, native trees, shrubs, and forbs also, different types of plants that provide habitat and food for the wildlife in this area. This is what we call ecological display area. It used to be uh, just a pasture land and about four acres of them. And what we're trying to do is that creating a window onto a coastal plain, the ecology of a coastal plain. We found was that every time we had a heavy rainfall event, we would have quite a bit of water coming down the drainage that's right behind me and eroding the stream channels just below the site. Part of our work with Earth Sangha has been to fence in this area and restore the native plants by planting grasses, shrubs, and native trees. The pond behind me has served several different functions. The original intent was to capture all the drainage that was coming down through the valley and hold it before it could go down through the stream and erode further. But it's also functioning as a spring pool in that it holds water during wet periods in the spring and provides habitat for amphibians for breeding, mainly salamanders, frogs, and toads. Because so much of suburbia consists of buildings, roads, parking lots, and bulldozer compacted turf, the landscape absorbs relatively little water, compared to what it once did when it was less paved and more forested. When it rains in the suburbs, a much smaller proportion of the water is now retained by plants in the soil, and a much larger proportion runs into the streams. If you go for a walk around here in the woods, these woods, um, or practically anywhere along a stream, you'll see a lot of down trees. This tree was just recently come down. It's a big American beech. It's still got all its leaves and so forth, so it fell just recently. And, and the immediate reason for its keeling over like that is that it has been undercut by the stream channel. Now, a certain amount of that kind of thing is natural, but what has happened in places like Northern Virginia is that uh, we have a runoff problem. We have a huge stormwater runoff problem. The land as a whole is much less absorbent than it used to be. It holds a lot less water. So every time we have a big storm, instead of the rain being absorbed directly into the soil where it fell, it all runs off and it ends up very rapidly in a place like this, in this uh, a little creek running through a forest. This stormwater runoff is causing all kinds of difficulties. It is, first of all, causing the channels to rearrange themselves very quickly. That's the kind of thing that knocks trees down. And there's also a lot of what we call thermal pollution that happens. The rain, as it runs off the, the parking lots or whatever, it's relatively warm compared to 
uh, the temperature, the natural temperature of a shaded stream like this one. And most uh, aquatic organisms only tolerate a certain relatively narrow range of temperature. So when you heat up the water like that, you make the water much less inhabitable for a, a large number of native species. So that's a big problem. We do a lot of uh, what we call riparian plantings. Uh, that is where we try to reestablish uh, native uh, natural vegetation along stream banks where that vegetation has, for whatever reason or another, uh, been subtracted out. It's been cut out, you know, to make turf or it's been destroyed for one, one reason or another. And you can see that kind of thing even here. See some of those tree tubes, we call them, behind me. This is actually a very good example of why this type of work is important. We're very interested in the aquatic communities and we're doing what we can to try to help conserve them and, and restore them. Acting locally, thinking globally, the Earth Sangha is now applying the lessons learned in Northern Virginia to a totally different area. We are interested in propagating our system as best as we can when we see an opportunity. And our biggest achievements in that regard is this program we call the Tree Bank Hispaniola. We got there as a partner with a Peace Corps volunteer back in 2006. To understand this a little bit better might help if I were to describe the kinds of problems that you see in this landscape. It is a very dysfunctional kind of farming landscape. The forest that remains is still managed in a kind of what we call a swidden pattern. It's basically a slash and burn. The forest is allowed to come up for a, a relatively short period of time in some parts of the farms and then it's burned again. These people are trying to grow beans. Beans are the big cash crop. But the soils are poor, so in order to grow these beans, they have to buy a lot of artificial fertilizer, which is very expensive. And it's uh, obviously it, that entails all kinds of environmental problems associated both with the production of the fertilizer and its use. They can't afford the fertilizer, so they have to take out these very high interest kind of loan shark loans in order to do this. That was the situation that we encountered when we started work down there. And we didn't really come in, sort of parachute in and attempt to impose any particular solution on it, but we, we had some ideas. The first thing we did was to, to set up a nursery. <laughs> it's, it's always what we seem to do. The big interest that we have is in this development of these native trees. Native tree propagation in this region is a bit of a novelty. It's not done very much. These native trees are being used to create little forest easements, little areas on the farms where the farmers agree formally, they actually sign a contract with us, to tend them and just let them come up as native forest. This confers a host of ecological benefits and it also allows us to develop some additional financial support for the farmers. We have a credit system now that is tied to these easements. This is the first low cost credit system as long as they agree to have these easements. The easements will extend, re-extend the native forest cover. That's pretty much an automatic good. The second kind of benefit is more utilitarian. There's a farm benefit in having more trees on the farms. It tends to build soil over the long term. So instead of constantly losing soil, uh, we hope that gradually some of our farms are moving into a situation in which they're actually creating soil. They're beginning to bank soil, which is what you need to do. There are also some important economic benefits, uh, and the most obvious of these is simply creating a more diverse income stream for the farmers. The farmers now will have a credit system which will give them a little more room to make rational decisions about how they want to run their farms. And another very important uh, benefit that we're working on right now is the development of a coffee export program. We hope to uh, market our, our farmers coffee under their own brand name up here. So the overall system, both ecologically and financially, it's more diverse and it's more stable. Working with a wide range of institutional and corporate partners in Northern Virginia, including government agencies, companies that provide volunteer opportunities for their employees, landscaping firms, other nonprofits and schools, the Earth Sangha is having an impact. In 2006, the Wild Plant Nursery received the Fairfax County Urban Forestry Award for tree conservation. In 2007, the nursery was recognized by St. John's Community Services for creating volunteer opportunities for people with disabilities. And in 2009, the Earth Sangha received the Fairfax County Environmental Excellence Award for organizations.
It's just a matter of long-term engagement. And we, the way we think of it, it's obviously, it's not just a um, sort of technical ecological stuff. I mean, there is that aspect, obviously, but it's not just that. It's also a way of recreating one's own life. It's a way of adding some meaning to one's own life through a better understanding of the kinds of connections that, that exist out here. And we actually, humans, have been behaving rather badly because of abusing the land that supports us. And then we are thinking that it's about time that we actually listen to the land, and listen to the nature, and then we actually do relate them. And how do you relate them? You can't relate them in abstract. You have to really relate them with your you know, body and mind together. And so we, as we're working along with them, we learn a lot more.